Hey everybody, Dr. Z, welcome to the Z Dog MD Show. Today's guest is a superstar, and it's one of those rare instances where I read an article that she'd written, uh, an op ed for the LA Times, um, and immediately emailed her, Googled her, emailed her, and was like, Can you please be on the show? And she was kind enough to accept. This is Dr. Rita Redberg. Uh, by the way, that's such a beautiful name. It sounds like a, <laughs> like a, like an actress from the golden era of Hollywood. Dr. Rita Redberg is professor of medicine at UCSF. She's a cardiologist and does a lot of other things that we'll get into. And she is here to talk about all the things. Rita Redberg, welcome to the show. I'm delighted to be here. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's a thrill. So this is what prompted me. And I want to start the whole thing. Just go strong on this. You wrote an article about cardiac stents in an op-ed in the LA Times. And it was basically saying, hey, your doctor may think you need this stent. Uh, here's why you may not, more or less. And how a lot of what we do in medicine is, it, it's not just not helpful, it can be harmful. And I wanna dive right into that. Why did you write that piece and why has this been a passion of yours in general? Okay, so I wrote the piece, I'm a cardiologist and for many years, I've been taking care of people with heart disease, like we do. And it has been also clear to me for many years, and particularly in the last 10 years, that we are doing a lot more stents than we need to be. Even over 10 years, even over the last 10 years? Oh, yes. Because it seems like we've always been doing stents, to me. Right. Yeah. I actually, I was a cardiology fellow in the 80s, and we had just started doing procedures in people's arteries to try to open them up in the 80s. And so I kind of grew up with the idea that we were going to open up people's arteries and this would make them better. And you were trained in it as well. Then. And I was trained in it. And then it only, you know, in the last 15, 20 years started to question it for a lot of reasons. Mm -hmm. But that particular piece got me Got, what got me going on that was another trial called the ischemia trial had been released at the American Heart Association meeting. And this trial compared people who got stents and people who got medicines uh, in who had blockages in their arteries. And they took people with severe blockages, with a lot of chest pain, a lot of symptoms. They randomized them. I mean, the trial was done pretty close to perfectly as trials go. You know, they really had thought about it very carefully for many years. And the results of that trial show that the people that got medicines did as well as the people that got stents. They were, they lived just as long, they had just as few heart attacks. And any way that you slice it, like if you look and see, well, if they had more severe disease, did they do better with stents? No. You know, if they had more positive test results from treadmill tests, did they do better with stents? No. And I thought, you know, th this is now about the 15th trial or so that has shown that same thing, but this trial was really carefully designed to address the, what was criticized in every previous trial. And so I thought, it's time to really think about we need to change practice in cardiology and stop sending people for stents when we haven't even offered them medical management because there's so many risks to stents. And, you know, people can have heart attacks, they can have strokes, they can have kidney failure, they can even die. Doesn't happen a lot. But if you can do just as well with medical management, why send people off for stents without even trying medical management? So what's crazy to me, and what really got me interested in that when I read your article, is that this has been the conventional wisdom in medicine since I, I mean, I trained in the late 90s, early 2000s at Stanford, a huge mm -hmm. cardiac program. Right. We stented everything that looked at us. Right. And it was a badge of honor, and we felt like we were doing good, and it was... It, I mean, you felt like lives were being saved right there versus doing nothing. Or And that's right. what medical management felt like. Well, you know, a beta blocker and a statin and a, uh -huh. you know, how, how is that controlling blood pressure? How is that helping this person with three vessel coronary disease? I mean, the analogy being all the pipes are clogged up. You need a rotor rooter to go in there right. and you need something to stand open this thing. And it just made sense. And so, but then when it was looked at, like you said, and what's interesting about the ischemia trial that you mentioned is it was designed kind of to address some of the criticisms of maybe other oh, trials. Yes. Absolutely. And, and and so, you know, what 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 if I what if I come back with you 
Rita and I say, well, but maybe it's treating pain better. Maybe we're controlling symptoms better. Is that even true? Mm -hmm. So that's a really good question. I think the investigators, they did some of the quality of life and pain assessments and said that people did better who had stents. I personally, I, I think it's a great trial. That is the part I do not believe because it was not a blinded trial. Oh. You know, in order... I mean, we know there's a placebo effect to doing procedures. Mm -hmm. And when you have a subjective endpoint, and, you know, pain is a very subjective endpoint, we know that people, you know, get relief from all kinds of things that, like procedures for sure, like 60% of people will feel better after having a procedure, just even though it was a sham or a fake procedure. And in fact for 20 years I've been saying how do we know it's the stent that makes a difference we have to have a blinded study we always do blinded studies with drugs like if you're going to test a drug you're going to take a drug and compare it to a sugar pill because otherwise you can't rule out it's a placebo effect to the drug but for some reason with devices even though the placebo effect is so much more powerful with devices than drugs we very rarely do that but it just happens a few years ago, a very um, clever and brave, I think, British group did a study with just that. So they randomized people. Everyone had blockages. They all had very severe coronary disease. They all got medicines, and they all thought they got a stent. Whoa. But, but actually, half of them got a stent, and the other half didn't. So, so they actually would get the percutaneous intervention, but they wouldn't have the stent deployed. Exactly. So a sham yes. angioplasty. Exactly. Yeah, or, or stent, yeah. And guess what? What happened? There was no difference oh, in chest Lord. pain. Oh. Every, that was a negative study. They increased their exercise time exactly the same as the people that got the real stent and the fake stent. Their change, their relief, they all felt better because they were getting medicines. The, the relief in symptoms was exactly the same between the fake stent and the real stent. The improvement in quality of life was exactly the same between the fake stent and the real stent. And so I think if you want to talk about symptoms, you have to have a placebo-controlled trial. You can't talk about did somebody improve on a subjective you know, symptom scale when placebo effect is very powerful. Now, placebo is certainly important, but let's call it what it is. Don't say it's the stent. It's the placebo effect. And, and why Why that meant? Okay, first of all, I had an emotional response to you saying this because uh -huh. think of the harm uh -huh. that we're potentially inflicting because we don't study these things correctly. Mm -hmm. and, and the placebo effect in devices, like you said, can be stronger because it's a big intervention. So the mind-body response to that is, oh my gosh, they're doing this thing. They're putting in this device or they're intervening in some physical way, therefore it must have an effect. Right. And the idea that doing these procedures is not without harm, like what are the harms of putting in a stent? Well, like a, you could have a heart attack, you could have a dissection in your, so the, we ruin the artery in your leg, you could die. You know, you get radiation from the whole procedure and so that increases your cancer risk, you get contrast and so that causes kidney problems for some people. And you have to be on additional drugs like these dual antiplatelet agents. So a lot of people will have bleeding problems. The stent itself can clot off. And um, we had someone uh, someone last week who had a stent clot off. It's a very uh, life threatening complication. So there, and it's and when I would say, like for the last twenty years, we can't say that. Angino, the chest pain is relieved better with stents than with medical therapy unless we do a placebo trial. And people would say to me, but Rita, it's unethical to do placebo. We can't do fake procedures. I said, well, it's unethical not to do it. Otherwise, you're, you're taking millions of people and giving them this procedure and you don't know whether it works any better than a dummy procedure. You, you, you said it, it's unethical not to do it. Not to do a placebo, sham. Placebo, to yes. do a sham. And, and you know what's, important in this, so you mentioned all the complications, all of which we were trained in, all of which I've experienced uh, mm -hmm. as an internist consulting, or my patient goes to cath and has these complications. Um, we're talking about patients with angina and multivessel or single vessel coronary disease. We're not talking about acute 
myocardial infarction, are we? That's correct. We're not talking about acute myocardial infarction where you're in the throes of a heart attack and then we know that stenting has an advantage. But right. we're talking about people that are having procedures electively. You know, they're, they're scheduled for the procedure or they're having a lot of chest pain or even if they're having a lot of chest pain, they're still, or if they have a lot of ischemia, if they have very positive treadmill tests, they were still included in the study and they still did equally well with medicines than they did with stents and medicines. Sick patients. Yes, yeah. they were sick patients. And, and when you talk about medical management, just so we can bring everyone up to speed, what are we talking about? Beta blockade, statins, blood pressure, other blood pressure control, what else do we do? Um, nitrates if you're having chest pain and aspirin. Got it, so some symptomatic control and then aspirin. Um, and could that also include Plavix or other uh, higher? Sometimes it does. Yeah, rarely. Yes. Yeah. So. You have this armamentarium of mm -hmm. medical management. Right. Did they look at lifestyle management or stress management or smoking cessation or other issues in this trial? They usually recall. do. It's, this trial was presented as a late breaker at the American Heart Association meeting, so the full paper hasn't been published. So we don't have all of the details of that trial, but definitely, Zubin, it's really important to pay attention to diet and physical activity and stop smoking and all of those things, no matter what arm of the study you're in. Right, right. And so... Now we have this information. We have a body of evidence that suggests, and you know, you can have a little back and forth on details, but it mm -hmm. seems like, mm -hmm. and this is the thing that really hits you, is compared to a sham <laughs> procedure, there's no benefit. Right. So that means we're doing things that can harm people, that cost a ton of money. Right. And remember, there's very little financial disclosure to patients. So, yes. oh, I'm an out-of-network cardiologist and a thing, you're gonna get a bill for $50,000. Like, right. So not only are we financially assaulting people inadvertently, we don't do this consciously, we, we are potentially causing them harm for something that the data now shows doesn't help beyond what we, our standard of care, do you expect that cardiologists are going to change their practice? Have you seen any evidence they're gonna change their practice? I just keynoted at the transcatheter therapeutics thing in San Francisco. I was in front of 4,000 of these people, good, amazing physicians who are passionate about the technology and the humanity of what they do. Mm -hmm. Are we gonna convince them that one of their staple bread and butter procedures that they are not only, they don't only believe in probably, but they feel like this is part of my identity. This is what I do. I intervene when people are sick. I'm the guy who fixes them. And we tell them actually you could just give them medicines, which means a primary doc or a non-invasive cardiologist could do it. Are they gonna change their practice? Well, Zubin, that's the billion dollar question. And that's exactly the group. And it is for all of those reasons you said. I mean, it is, True, we have to acknowledge we have fee-for-service medicine largely in this country, and as a cardiologist, I would get paid a lot more to do a stent than I would to talk to you or to give you medicines. Mm. But it's also true that we have a lot of incredibly you know, dedicated, hardworking cardiologists that believe, just like you said, that they are doing great things by putting stents in people. And as I said, we started doing these procedures, well, you know, like in the 80s, 90s, and we've been doing them now for a long time. So mm -hmm. there is a whole generation of cardiologists that grew up believing in this procedure. And everyone, like you saw at the conf at TCT, everyone believes in this procedure. And that's very hard to change a culture. And that's why um, I think it's really important that we should be, we should have done these studies that we just talked about 40 years ago. Mm. So before we start adopting a new study, a new practice, and before the FDA approves a new technology, we should require that there is high quality evidence that you're actually better off having, in this case, the device or the procedure than you would be not having it. Mm. But sadly, we didn't do that for stents, and we're still not doing it for so many new technologies. And, and it seems like once the cat's out of the bag and you approve it and people start implementing it and they start getting paid for it and they start seeing results. Now, this, this so bear right. with me. I'm a, I'm a cardio, and, and we're gonna stop picking on cardiologists in a second, we're gonna pick on some other people, but cardiologists mm -hmm. see that someone's having chest pain, they're having discomfort, they intervene, they get 
better. They see it time and time again. It becomes woven into the fabric of their practice and their experiential understanding of and their relationships with patients who have expectations that the cardiologist is going to do something. And right. so there's patient expectation, there's publicity, they're talk to each other. There's a whole thing that happens. Now, now you're going to have to unwind this and go, actually, guys, we never really studied this right. You could do the same sham procedure and patients will get better. So mm -hmm. your act of touching the patient, of mm -hmm. engaging with the patient, of being you in the presence of the patient, help that patient along with the medicine that mm -hmm. we gave. Exactly. So it's okay to not do the stent, but man, it's hard. Because right. And also like they're already, you know, they're going to push back and say, but this is our bread and butter too. This is how we make money. Right. And you mentioned fee for service. If, if we switch to fee for value, it's still like, well, then maybe we need less of interventional cardiologists. So that means... There's another bread and butter issue. So how do we think about those things? It's, it seems intractable. I know it's not because there's a solution to every problem. But what, how, how do you think <laughs> like about that. it? I'm worried like even for you to write an op-ed like that, part of me in the back of my mind is like, you know, some random community cardiologist is going to do it, like come by and like, you know, inject you with, uh, you know, two drugs that interact and 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 you'll you, you know mm. you'll die without anyone ever being able to trace it i mean i'm joking mm -hmm. but I i'm also so. <laughs> yeah for you i yeah. am but i i worry yeah. about right people's motivations were only as good as our conditioning and our incentives you know so how, how do you think about this that's a lot to put on your plate well but they're all good questions mm. i'll tell you a few years ago because i have been thinking about these issues for a while and and as we said i mean i do think highly of my cardi my interventional cardiology colleagues but as you said it's it's very hard to look at it, study objectively when that's what you go to work to do every day right. even take out the money just the culture the whole belief that you're fixing something i mean if you have been listened to the consent we could fix you or we could do nothing that's which is medicine the consent. right i yeah. mean that's essentially what i've heard some people at other institutions say but so and and i have I don't know if it's true, but a colleague told me like five or 10 years ago, there's a Society for Cardiac Angiography and Intervention. It's the other big interventional cardiology group. They mm. had a list of the top 10 threats to interventional cardiology at the meeting, and I was on the list. Oh, what? Hold on. I'm going to shine a little more yeah. light on you because okay. I, I, I want people to carefully and, and clearly see the enemy of cardiology, the, oh, okay. the top 10, Thank who you. is a cardiologist, Thank right? You. No, I could, I, I could actually... I'm unsurprised by that. Yeah. And you know what? Honestly, if I'm being fully authentic, mm -hmm. part of the reason I was drawn to invite you on the show is I mm -hmm. saw mm -hmm. in between the lines of what you were writing, a mm -hmm. great personal risk taker who says, mm -hmm. I am part of this tribe, but mm -hmm. I'm willing to speak truth to the tribe in service of not just our patients, which is so important, but the tribe itself. Mm -hmm. Because we are a community of people who went into this to help people. Right. And if our next generation of cardiologists comes out and says, you know what, okay, this thing was a thing, we did it, we did it with good intent, mm -hmm. we did it with good outcome, but mm -hmm. we could do it better because mm -hmm. we've learned now, then that's a beautiful thing. So right. thank you for doing that that's work. Right. It's really and that's hard. Right. And that is why I do it, because I do believe, I mean, I went into medicine to help people and I believe that's what most doctors did. But you asked earlier, like, how did I start looking at these things? Mm -hmm. You know, I think... It was a number of things. I grew up in Brooklyn way before it was hip <laughs> in a house, you know, where pretty modest and we didn't waste anything. We didn't, you know, my parents were the original reusers and recyclers. And I, w I was taught, you know, not to waste things, not if you could. And I then Are, are your put parents myself, Jewish? <laughs> are yeah, they Jewish? Yeah, well, Redberg, are Redberg? they Jewish? Because yeah. as, as an Indian yeah. immigrant uh -huh. of, of Zoroastrian yeah. parents, same thing. Yeah. It's like you don't waste anything. Right. You reuse everything. Yeah, yeah that's it's a why I'm carrying them. Well, also for the environment now. But they were even before the environment. They reused their That's bottles. why we're shooting this in my garage. <laughs> 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 but and I put myself through with the help of work scholarships and loans through medical school through college and medical school and and when I got to medical school I was at the University of Pennsylvania and mm. at that time John Eisenberg was there and he luck luckily was my sort of medical school advisor because I was planning to do general internal medicine at mm. that time and he was doing a big study, and this was in the 70s, so it was before email. So he's, he would send a note every day to the house staff, the trainees, and ask them about the daily laboratory tests that everyone draws every morning. You know, if you go into the hospital, you get the chemistries, we look at your sodium, potassium. And he was trying to make them think about 
do they really need to have these tests every day? And so the note would say, we noticed you got a CHEM7 on your patients. Did you feel that these results changed the management of the patient? Did it lead to something that was really good for the patient? Could you have done the same thing without these test results? And then he looked at whether this had any impact on the house staff laboratory test ordering. Mm. And it had no impact on Mm. the laboratory test ordering because, like you said, it's kind of their culture. Mm. But it had a big impact on me because I was a second-year medical student, and I thought, wow, everything that the the house staff, who to me were like brilliant like gods because they were already done with medical school and doctors and training. And I thought, he's questioning what they're doing. And I just assumed that everything that I was being taught to do had a good reason. And he explained, and we went through the literature, and I understood there was absolutely no studies that ever showed that people were better off if you did these daily laboratory tests on inpatients than if you didn't. And so it really changed the way I sort of went through the rest of my medical training because it made me start to question, is this for any kind of test or procedure, are people really going to be better off because I'm ordering this test or I'm going to do this procedure? And if I can't say, yes, they are, then I wouldn't do it because like you said, everything has some harms to it. Yeah. Everything. Every single thing. That That's such a powerful lesson for yeah. young people in training. I had the same lesson at UCSF. Mm-hmm. Uh, I forget who it was, but they would basically say, look, if, if your test isn't going to change outcome, don't mm-hmm. even think about doing it. Don't think about malpractice. Don't think about covering your butt, all this, because that's a part of it too, right? Is, right. is People are worried if I, an error of omission. Right. And they're less worried about errors of commission exactly where i do something and it leads down a path of what we call iatrogenesis right physician causing harm that that ends up costing the patient their their life or limb right we 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 hardly get penalized for that we get penalized for i didn't order the unnecessary ct scan that would have caught the cancer that we didn't suspect so right it's that kind of conditioning that and we're fear-based creatures so when i saw that too it changed my whole thinking and and it's interesting because I think there is, and this is me speculating now, but mm-hmm. I think there's a group of people that are unhappy in the matrix of conditioned mm-hmm. um, expectation, and they tend to chafe against it, and they're always looking for holes and where it could be wrong. And I think those people tend to um, be marginalized in medical culture mm-hmm. because it is it is a kind of a it evolves into a group think because then we have consensus and then mm-hmm. we have our procedures and the standard of care and so on. And and what we forget is that, no, no, medicine is always kind of pushed forward by questioning, by Ignaz Semmelweis going, Mm -hmm. you know what, if you wash your hands, Mm -hmm. uh, you don't die of purpural sepsis when you're pregnant and you're delivering. And and he was, you know, he died in an insane asylum. Mm -hmm. So this is like the seminal teaching that we do have to question and understand when consensus is, is appropriate. Like for example, vaccines, right? You can question vaccines. We did. Mm-hmm. We have a lot of answers now mm-hmm. that they're right. okay. So yeah. it, it's that kind of thinking. So how do you think? How do you think we can change the culture? Is it that we need to just stop reimbursing for these things? Like how, how do you yeah. start to do it? Well, believe me, I think about that a lot, mm-hmm. um, and I think it, it takes a lot of steps. But I think it. I mean, reimbursement, sort of changing FIFA service and orienting our thinking more towards outcomes and value-based payment would definitely help. Mm. But it it's not. It, it is the culture, mm. and the culture now is just to, to order more tests. It's always, it's generally accepted that more tests are better than less tests. That a higher tech solution is better than a low tech solution. You know, if one pill is good, two pills must be better. And a little information can't hurt. Mm. And actually, it's why I'm editor of GEM Internal Medicine. We we launched this series called Less is More when Deborah Grady, one of the deputy editors, and I were talking. And it was actually right after um, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force issued the mammography guidelines back in 2010 when they said that women between the ages of 40 to 49 um we're going to have more harms than benefits mm. from screening mammography. Mm. And if you remember, remember that it. was very it was poorly storm. received. Storm. Yeah. yeah. And it was a lot of, and it was a storm from everyone, a storm from breast cancer patients saying, if I hadn't had my mammogram right. and so on and so forth and so on and so forth, not right. understanding the data and the statistics behind why that recommendation was made. Exactly. Yeah. And the recommendation was just because there were more harms than, yeah. than good that That's came right. out of mammography in that age group. And, 
we thought, well, people must not be getting the message about harm,、mm. you know, because nobody would want to be harmed. Right. And so, so we launched the Less Is More series, and we, you know, encourage. Uh, research submissions, as well as people to share their own experiences, particularly trainees in the series called Teachable Moments. So, trainees can write in and say, you know, I had a patient who suffered a complication from an, an unnecessary test, and, you know, this is what I learned from it, and then share, you know, how we all could learn so we would avoid this unnecessary test in the future. But it is Part of the culture, too. And so when you're making rounds, you know,、uh, you're right, the house, if I think, are more afraid of not ordering a test because nobody, the, the kind of attending you had is not yet the norm, but hopefully. Right. Where, and so if someone says, oh, why didn't you order, you know, the serum magnesium? It's just much easier to have ordered more tests、mm. than to explain why you didn't get a test that you didn't think was necessary.、Mm. It, it, it. The editor of JAMA Internal Medicine does a series called Less Is More.、Mm-hmm. That's you. How was that received? So, that has been received very well. That's good. I think. That's I mean, certainly the people we hear from are a lot of doctors who say they're really happy that we're talking about it, that they think you know, the profession has gone a little too far in terms of embracing doing more things without. Sort of critically evaluating it because、mm. there's so many more things we can do now. I think it was different 30, 40 years ago when you know, we didn't have all of the armamentarium that we do now. But you know, now- was, that, that's when Sam Shem wrote House of God and he、yeah. was talking about, well, you either give them the Lasix or you don't, or、yeah. you, know, you give them the steroids or you don't. Right. And still, that was a critical decision point because if you screw it up, you, know, you could hurt somebody. And、uh, now it's like we're drowning in this stuff. And like you said, I think a better tech solution is always perceived as more effective. And then you end up with disasters like vaginal mesh.、Mm-hmm. And so, so I, a quick, quick, quick aside I have a very、uh, close relative who was talked into doing Mona Lisa Touch, which is a vaginal resurfacing procedure、mm-hmm. for, you know,、uh, for incontinence and, and that sort of thing、um, by their obstetrician, who's a community obstetrician.、Mm-hmm. No evidence this thing works.、Mm-hmm. Some evidence that it can cause harm,、um, but high compensation for it because it's not insurance covered, self pay、mm-hmm. kind of thing. And so, this obstetrician, who I happen to know is a very good doctor,、mm-hmm. buys into this idea that I can help this person with this laser remodeling、mm-hmm. and they can feel better. And, they,、mm-hmm. and the patient is buying into it because they're looking for a relief that is beyond a pessary or something、mm-hmm. that they feel is unpleasant.、Mm-hmm. And then the FDA came out and gave a warning about it and、mm-hmm. said, you know, this is not something that people、mm-hmm. should be doing. And I'm having this conversation with this relative going, you know, this is the thing as a patient, we、mm-hmm. have to ask difficult questions. What's the data? And、right. it's hard because we don't know as patients, we don't know how that. We want our doctors to be the experts. We want a paternalistic or maternalistic doctor to tell us what to do, but that's、right. not how you get the best care. And I think one of the things I saw in your history, being you know, JAMA Internal Medicine Editor, which is, by the way, amazing. I want to ask you at some point how you deal with things like retractions and other、mm-hmm. things like that. There may be another show, but、mm-hmm. the, the, the,、um, The idea that、um, shared decision making with our patients,、mm-hmm. ha- having them be a part of this decision. What are your hopes, dreams, and fears, and wishes, and goals? And here's my knowledge base, and I'm your shepherd. I'm、mm-hmm. like a, almost a shaman in this. Like, let me sit with you、mm-hmm. in a place that's kind of sacred, which is the exam space or、mm-hmm. the consult room. And let me actually be compensated to, to、mm-hmm. take care of you that way. And let's talk about this in a way that. You're actually also getting some healing benefit from even talking to someone who cares about you.、Right. But instead, it's like, hey, I have this great new laser. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> the laser, and we can resurface the inside、right. and make you feel better. Right. It's kind of heartbreaking. It really is heartbreaking, Zuman, I mean, because I think it, it's so true what you said. I, mean, I think medicine, I feel it's a great privilege to be a doctor, and people trust us, and I feel that we have to earn that trust by doing the right thing.、Mm. And I think so many people do come into my office and your office and doctor's offices and they want to talk. And, and it's very therapeutic to talk about whatever it is that's bothering them, whatever physical or other ailment that's bothering them. 
And so often, now we have this big list of things that you have to check off in for every visit, particularly for internists, the primary care physicians. But for all of us, I think everyone's feeling so much time pressure, and there's this perception that um, you have to move on to the next patient and can't let people talk, and I think it's very harmful. And the reimbursement system kind of feeds it, but I think a lot of times... Like doctors will say, well, I ordered the test because that's what the patient wanted. I, mm. I don't think that is really what the patient wants. I think patients, they want to know they're healthy and they want reassurance, but they would be happy for you to talk to them and explain why they don't need the test. I mean, I, I do that in, or they don't need this particular medicine. I see a lot of patients who want to get off statins who are in primary prevention, and they're very happy to know that they don't actually need to take that medicine that was really making them uncomfortable and that they're not going to die if they stop their stents. And, and you know, people, people feel relieved. I mean, now we've gotten, I feel, too far into the, uh, to the realm of taking perfectly healthy people and labeling them with pseudo-diseases like pre-diabetes. I mean, what is that? Mm. I mean, as Deborah Grady said, we're all pre-dead. You know, <laughs> it, it's not a disease. You know, this is... And so it's like when people don't have symptoms, I think we should leave healthy people oh, alone. Oh man, you are just you're you're speaking my language and you're rifling right up against the mainstream of medicine which is already struggling to make ends meet in some way and feel like an extra 25,000 or $50,000 would make their lives so much happier an extra 5 minutes with patients, but the truth is mm -hmm. what would make their lives happier? Mm -hmm. This is my theory coming from personal experience, is the ability to connect with our patients on a human level, to reassure them that everything's gonna be okay, that they don't have a disease. Mm -hmm. At our clinic, Turntable Health, when we were running it in, in, in Las Vegas, we had a whole wall dedicated mm -hmm. to brown paper bags full of medications that we'd taken patients off. Mm -hmm. It wasn't, oh, we got him to take his mm -hmm. metformin, or we got him to do mm -hmm. this, or we made a new diagnosis of prediabetes by screening everybody and finding a hemoglobin A1C of 5.467 yeah. or whatever it is. Right. It's like, no, 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 we spent time with this person. We learned their hopes and their dreams. We, we explained to them what they read on the internet and walked mm -hmm. through it with them. And how mm -hmm. do you do that? You need a little more time, but really you need a change in culture. You need a team to support your ability to do do that mm -hmm. and you need an electronic record that supports the management and care of patients rather than just being a billing platform and if you can do that mm -hmm. at the minimum i think we can start to see people will start to look for holes in our treatments that like doctors will be trained to go okay but does that really work mm -hmm. let's really look at this does that spine surgery is it really necessary mm -hmm. for that you know spine? can yeah. you it, it just just humor me for a second sorry give me a list of like five or six things whatever you can think of the top of your head that we do commonly that really doesn't have great evidence that we should be doing it. Well, spine surgery is a very a good start. I mean, a lot of the knee arthroplasties, you know, and again, we didn't know that until they, they did sham knee sham arthroplasties the arth yeah. and people improved just as much again because it was subjective. I mean, we overuse a lot of antibiotics. Mm, thousand percent, yes. Uh, you know, for... I mean, 90% of upper respiratory infections are viral and are going, it's my father, they'll go away in seven days if you take the medicine and a week if you don't. That's my father used to tell me. <laughs> um, uh, well, statins for primary prevention to me is a huge, you know, even I, I, I don't see the benefit for just about anyone in primary prevention, but a lot of the patients I see, even by the guidelines, they're low risk and wouldn't benefit from any kind of statin use. And I think that's a big area of overuse. Let me pause on the statins for a second because this one's a little bit close to home. My dad mm -hmm. is on tenolipitor. My mom's on tenolipitor purely because uh, you know their cardiologist said, well, you're Indian and primary prevention and there's some family history. And my dad is tired, and as he gets mm -hmm. older, he has symptoms that I listen to him, and I go, you need to stop that statin, but he's almost superstitiously attached to it now. If I mm -hmm. stop it, what if I have a heart attack or a stroke mm -hmm. or something? How, how, how do you talk to your patients about statins like that if you're taking them off? Mm -hmm. I just go through the data. I mean, if they mm -hmm. want to stay on it, I just explain to them that you know, the data 
for and it you can do the risk calculator and see you know what percent risk is because even in the guidelines like mm. people that are well it used to be less than 10 percent 10-year risk now for reasons that are not clear it was dropped to less than 7.5 percent but a lot of those people are in that low risk group but even in the high risk group i mean the what the data shows even in for high risk primary prevention is that if you took 100 people who took statins every day for five years, two out of 100 would avoid a heart attack and nobody would live longer. Mm. So that means 98 people have absolutely no benefit mm. from taking the statin every day for five years. And a lot of people have side effects that I think are much more dangerous than the statin because they're unable to walk, they're unable to enjoy life, they're fatigued, they have muscle aches and pains, and they can't exercise, which is, I think, much worse than you know, whatever their cholesterol is. But I feel like a lot of things, if you have to have a test to find out you have the disease, you really need to look carefully at that data. And, mm. you know, high cholesterol, in my opinion, is not a disease. What an interesting way to look at that. If you have to have a test to find out that you have a disease, you should be careful and look at that. That's really, really, really insightful because it's true, like high cholesterol, is it a disease? Is it, is it a marker of something else? Yeah. A lifestyle issue, a stress issue, right. some genetic issue. There's so many things, right? I'm sure Dean Ornish mm. and these other guys are very much into that whole field. Um, but 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 the idea of statins being, and when, let's just clarify what primary prevention is. It means you're trying to prevent your first heart attack or stroke or bad. Or well, first blockage, right? You don't have angina. You don't have a stent. Right? Nothing. You don't, right? Maybe you have high high lipids. Right. By, you might by have high testing. lipids, and you might have a family history, but mm -hmm. that's still that's primary it. prevention. Yeah, yeah. You know what's crazy? My dad didn't even have really high lipids. Yeah. And I think you know, here's an interesting. Again, I'm gonna I'm gonna <laughs> hash on this for a second because it really upset me when it happened. He had some atrial fibrillation, mm -hmm. and the cardiologist, for some other reason, I think because his brother, my dad's brother, had a uh, MI at age 41. Mm -hmm. His dad's brother lives in India, mm -hmm. is a dentist, very high stress, mm -hmm. different world, breathing right. diesel smoke all day, mm -hmm. all of this. Right. So my dad gets a cath. Mm -hmm. This was 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And they find some trace mm -hmm. calcification in mm -hmm. the LAD. Mm -hmm. and my dad pretty much loses his mind. He's an internist. Mm -hmm. So he's like, I better take a statin, I better do this, I better mm -hmm. do that. He's walking on the treadmill, he's doing all of this. And to this day, I, I feel like that was such a disservice mm -hmm. yeah. that, that it didn't do him any good. It made him more anxious. Right. And it, it made him nervous about exercising too because he'd be worried about, well, I have this thing and I don't want, I'm, oh my God, dad. Yeah. <laughs> that's it, what we, that's what we can do inadvertently. It right. is very sad. And I bet a lot of people listening who are gonna leave comments are gonna tell stories about their loved ones or themselves mm -hmm. who went through this. Now you had gone, you were going through a list. So you got to statins. We talked about knees and spines, spines and we talked already about cardiac stents. Um, what about like unnecessary CT scans and oh. radiation? Well, there's a huge number of unnecessary CT scans. I mean, the numbers have risen exponentially on our use of CT scans and part of that is i mean we get nice pictures but again you have to ask did you need the pictures mm -hmm. why you know why does everyone with stomach pain have to get an abdominal ct scan and my colleague at ucsf rebecca smith beinman has done a lot of really nice work you know documenting n not just how, how what the increase in ct scans is but how we're not very careful about keeping the lowest radiation dose possible for each CT scan. So mm. we published a paper of hers in JAM Internal Medicine almost 10 years ago now, where she did a survey and found that there was between a threefold and like 40-fold difference in how much radiation you got from the same CT scan, depending on the day you got it or the institution you got it. That's it crazy. Varied. Yeah, and so there's just so that. much yeah. radiation, both some from unnecessary testing and some maybe you needed the CT scan, but you should have had much lower dose radiation. Right. And now, you know, in the transcriptions, they write A-L-A-R or whatever, as low yeah. as reasonable. And I don't exactly. know what that means exactly. Right. My wife's a radiologist and I'm probably, if I told her this, she'd be like, oh no, we do good. But yeah. no, actually that's not true. No, she's told me, she's like, no, we're very, we were very cognizant of this issue, especially since that study came out. Because yeah. I think that raised, and that that's why, that, that's why, 
data and evidence mm. actually matters, yes. right? And that's your other hat, right? You're, you're right. editor editor uh, in chief for JAMA Internal Medicine. What do you think the state is of our evidence now? Are we, is peer review broken? Is it working? Are we putting out mm. evidence that's good? Um, yeah, I, I do. And I guess some cancer screenings, I think, are in the, like... Oh, actually, yeah, yeah, like, yeah cancer screening in older people, you know, the test force generally recommends stopping at age 75 because it takes at least 10 years to see any benefit from even indicated cancer screenings, but a lot of people are still getting cancer screenings into their 80s and 90s. Paps, mammogram. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You see it all the time, and right. then you get a false positive, and then you have to chase it down, and right. then you cause harm and anxiety. Yes. Um, so, so, I mean, there's quite a bit, and I bet there's a lot more that we haven't identified that doesn't work mm -hmm. that we do. Oh, yes. I mean, even, even now, even if you look at it like an appendectomy, and I'm going to pick mm -hmm. on something just yeah, random, like sure. appendectomy, like, right. well, medical management of appendectomy is actually a thing too, mm -hmm. and antibiotics and so on. And That's so the right. question is, do you need to cut someone open with the risks of creating someone who maybe has adhesions and mm -hmm. p potential small bowel obstruction in the future and uh, wound infection, whatever. Right. I mean, the risks are low, but they're there. Exactly. If you could treat with antibiotics. Right. And again, I don't know the literature on it, but I know that it's an ongoing study. Right. There was a study that suggested you could do equally well with antibiotics. And that's or, one of those things where like surgeons and other doctors will go, well, that's one of the great success stories, man, is that you would mm -hmm. die if you don't get that appendix mm -hmm. out. But the thing is, have we ever done the <laughs> the study, mm, except in people who right. were not surgical candidates in which they have bad protoplasm, as we say, to begin with. Right. They're not a surgical candidate because they have a lot of other medical problems, so they may do worse no matter what you do. Right. So these kind of things, and designing those trials and making sure mm -hmm. that they're very smartly run mm -hmm. is probably a big component of that. Absolutely. Um, and, and you have to be vigilant about that. But I think... Um, I think going down that route, you know, what are the challenges you see in terms of getting this message out? Because mm -hmm. you have these different platforms. You're a UCSF professor, JAMA mm -hmm. Internal Medicine. You have a voice. Mm -hmm. um, you write for Washington Post and New York Times and mm -hmm. LA Times. And these are big mm -hmm. uh, entities. Um, what, do you feel like you're being heard? Do you feel like this is an uphill battle still? What do you think we need to do as a tribe of healthcare people, my audience, to help mm -hmm. you do this? I feel both of those things. I feel I'm being heard, but I feel it's an uphill battle mm. because because um, there's a lot, you know, our culture is still oriented, I think, towards doing more and doing more. And so people are thinking about it, but I think we haven't quite changed our medical education. We haven't changed our sort of culture of medicine. We haven't changed our payment system. And there's a very heavy influence of pharmaceutical, you know, both drug and device lobbying that really influences um, how decisions are made. Like, I used to be on the Medicare Evidence Development and Coverage Advisory Commission, and mm. we were a, a large group of experts that review evidence for Medicare on particular technologies that they ask you to look at. And, for example, they um, this was... 2004, I think, they wanted to look at, they asked Medcac to look at cardiac CT. And we looked at all the evidence, and it was clear that there was no benefit to p people that were having cardiac CT. They weren't any better off than they were without it, mm. based on the literature back at that time. But for really political reasons, Medicare instead of issuing a non-coverage decision, which is what you would, if you look at the evidence, you ask your experts, is there any evidence of benefit? And they say, no, you would say, okay, we're not going to cover it. Cause that would, but that's not what happened. Instead, mm -hmm. Medicare declined to issue a coverage decision on cardiac mm -hmm. CT. Mm -hmm. And within a year, there had been a lot of lobbying from the people that make the cardiac CT and mm. from the radiologists and the cardiologists that mm. read the or do the cardiac CT on the regional level. Because if it's, there's not a national coverage decision made in Medicare, then it goes to the regional carriers. Mm. And the regional carriers, after this big lobbying effort, within a year, all had very permissive cardiac CT policies. Mm. And then people bought their machines, which are not cheap. And so you know, once you buy the machine, you tend to keep it busy. And Medicare noticed a huge increase in cardiac CT. So three years later, they tried to pull back the coverage. No way. 
It's never going to happen. No, that's what, you know, once you start doing something, it's, and that's why it's so important mm. to kind of look at it, but there are, you know, lobbying is just one force, but it's pretty powerful. I mean, I think, you know, the drug and device lobby is the biggest lobbying group in D.C. There's, mm. you know, multiple lobbyists per congressional representative. And so even, you know, the, the last... Uh, big legislation, the 21st Century Cures Act, which was passed um, in the, the end of the Obama administration, you know, said that we were going to require even less evidence to approve new drugs mm -hmm. and devices. Mm -hmm. It was, from what I've heard, very heavily influenced by the pharma and um, device lobbies. It's so but Congress went along. It's so interesting because as a, as a muggle, a non-medical person, mm -hmm. um, if you're a patient... You're going to want the barrier in your mind, the barrier to experimental and, and, and medications being approved to be very low so that you can get this so pharma can innovate. This is the, the, this is the party line, right? And, mm -hmm. and, and so on and so forth. And so anything that drops those regulatory hurdles is going to be better until you realize that when you get a drug out on the market mm -hmm. that d has no benefit, costs right. 3x what the current drug uh, does, has side effects that have not been adequately picked up by post-marketing surveillance because we don't have a super robust apparatus, especially for devices, right. especially for devices, um, then they would realize that, oh, we're probably killing more people mm -hmm. than we were before. Now, when you really feel that, there would be outrage in the streets, but it's very hard to feel that, and it's mm -hmm. and we're and it's made more difficult by the financial incentives of these large companies to lobby. Mm -hmm. And I don't like to actually villainize the companies or the people because what they're doing is behaving mm -hmm. entirely exactly. rationally. This right. If I were there and yeah. I, my fiduciary responsibility to my stockholders, right, I would be sending people to K Street, lob lobbying and lobbying and lobbying sure. and lobbying because that's what you do. So they're very good business people. Kudos to them. We right. need to change their business model by changing the incentives, by changing the structure of how we how we do these things and that means really looking at the evidence remember when when ACA started to come out they were talking about using evidence-based medicine more right and where did that go what happened there you know you start that's what think, I wonder what happened there think. yeah when they're writing the bills you know pharmaceuticals are like well you know this piece or whatever it is and the medical device piece you, you've seen or mm -hmm. heard of the documentary the bleeding edge I imagine I was in the bleeding edge you were in it yes you know what's funny? I thought I recognized yeah. you when I saw you because I did a whole show on that where uh -huh. I watched it. And you were in it. So what was your role in that? Were you talking about... Um, I talked a little bit about device regulation and the process. Oh, when the they 510K. got into the more general, the 510K and the, wow. and the PMA. So what yeah. do you think the average listener here should know just distill from that whole world of medical device approval. What, what is it that can help them when they're making decisions about devices? Well, the kind of questions that you were mentioning earlier that patients should ask their doctors about, you know, what is the evidence? I think it's really important to ask that for yeah. devices. You know, what is the evidence? You know, how good was the evidence? What, were there any clinical trials? I mean, now there are devices that are a lot on the market without any clinical data showing their benefit. Right, because they're substantially similar to a prior generation or something, right? Exactly. That's 510K or whatever. 510K. 510K, right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And and so I forget the name of the device that was the uh, sterilization device they were using. Escher. Escher, yeah. yeah. And after I did that show, yeah. and I basically gave this kind of balanced opinion of what I thought the challenges were with medical yeah. devices, so many patients who've had mm -hmm. that device reached out and, and would tell stories and anecdotes. And it's very hard to hear, you know? Yeah. And again, who, without the raw data without the trials yeah. how can you know because the problem with anecdotes is they don't create they're not science in themselves they're the start right but they're not science and so you have to study it and yet we're not incentivized or required to do that properly that's exactly. the big challenge that's right and i think as you said it it takes change on a lot of level but we and it's hard just for patients because i think we've you know, I think it is going to take patience to be outraged, but I don't think most people realize that these devices that doctors are recommending may not have 
high quality evidence of benefit. Mm. I mean, they might certainly some devices are great and life saving, and mm. you know we're very grateful for them. But there are definitely other devices that are dangerous mm. and shouldn't be used. And I don't think pa- patients are in a position to be able to separate that. How can we and expect that, them to? No, you know, we're saying I don't oh, think be, we be a, can be a more educated patient. Yeah, but that's hard. Even doctors like I. My my you know my dad's a doctor. He right. chose to get that stent because his cardiologist was like, yeah, you need. I mean, not stent. You need you need to get mm. the angioplasty. It's like, oh my gosh, you know how a patient has no chance, right. no chance if we're struggling, and that, I think that's got to be the next wave of change. Is we have to lead people in our own tribe to say, right. listen, we can do better and we that's can be right. empowered. Because one of the things, like I think this physician burnout thing, I've talked mm-hmm. about it and reframing it as moral injury, which is an externalization saying, it's not so much us, it's the system. But I need to reframe even that reframing and say, this is true. But the other piece of it is there, there are ways we frame our own purpose mm-hmm. that can so much change our, our thinking and our feeling and our experience with our own careers. And one of those framings is, hey, I went in this to help people. So if I'm having a bad day or I'm having a struggle or I'm worrying how, how can the system be overcome and I can reconnect to the, oh, the reason I'm stressed about that is not mm. this, this stress going into the ether and me just struggling and it's a fight or flight response. It's I'm stressed because I care. Mm -hmm. I care about my patients. I care about the people that I work with. I care about that. So this stress is okay. This is stress that will build resilience. And I'm gonna now reframe my experience before I go in the room that, hey, you know what? Even if I have to spend an extra 10 minutes and run late to actually explain to this patient, hey, this is why you don't need X, Y, or Z. Mm -hmm. In conjunction with them, listening to them, sharing the decision. It it can transform your own experience of how difficult and and untenable your job is. And that's something I wanna talk about more because I think it leads into Mm -hmm. this idea of less is more. Like, you know what, let's let's have some self-compassion. You don't have to do everything Mm -hmm. for people. That's not Mm -hmm. what makes you a great doctor. What makes you a great doctor or a nurse practitioner or a PA Mm -hmm. or a nurse or a dietitian or whatever it is, a social worker, Mm -hmm. is being present witnessing who that patient is Mm -hmm. and understanding and being compassionate towards yourself and your own limitations in that setting. So more and more, I think if we can think in that nuanced way, and it's hard Mm -hmm. because everything's reduced to a soundbite now and Mm -hmm. medical education has gotten so crazy and reductionist and like, let's get this test out of the way and let's do that and let's go through the rotation and click the boxes and you know kiss the attendings ring so one day we're the ring that's kissed. It's a very, we've really got to rethink that. Um, And again, to bring it back to this, what intrigued me about you is you're one of the people who's, who are doing that. And I, I just wanna kind of wrap around this and also let you talk about anything you're interested in towards the end here, but how has that been for you, just mm-hmm. personally, as we come up on an hour? Mm-hmm. Um, personally, as a professor, someone with a career, someone with a family, a woman in medicine, which is also has got its own, that's a whole talk in itself, because mm-hmm. that's something you've studied as well, too, is the discrepancies in how we study women in trials. Yes. How has this been for you choosing this particular path? Because mm-hmm. it would have been so much easier to just go the other way and kind of go, well, here's the new device. And here's, right. right. Has it been a struggle or has it been well, just I who mean, you are? It, it would have been easier, but it wouldn't have been me. So ah. <laughs> listen I mean, carefully me, to that, guys. That's, you know, I thought about. I mean, I'm often, you know, if I'm asked to de- to debate, you know, to take the whatever side on that other people aren't taking, and it would certainly be easier to, you know, but it doesn't feel right. You know, mm. I, I really, and, and I have, I feel very lucky. I think I have a, a fantastic job. I love, you know, being a professor at UCSF. It's I love the journal. I love working with students and residents and trainees and, I have research projects on medical device regulation, trying to suggest how we could improve the evidence base and improve post-market surveillance and, you know, get the FDA more focused on mission of protecting the public health and not so focused on getting things that may be dangerous to market quickly, which Mm. is not innovation. That's just not a good idea. Mm. And so, and if I think about, well, it'll be easier not to do this is, I've decided a long time ago, you know, I only go going around once and I have to do what I think is the right thing Mm. to do. And, 
And that's rewarding to me because I mean, people do, just like you said, when I sit in an office with a patient and you can really talk to them and, you know, not order a, a test or a drug, but just, you know, talk about what's important to them and reassure them. It's very rewarding to me. Yeah. It's a and I enjoy reward. my work. And so, um, that's, and it's, you know, it, so that's its own reward, but I would like, to see, you know, sort of improvements in our healthcare system because what worries me is we spend so much money on healthcare in this country and yet so many people, even now people with insurance, forget about that there's 35 million Americans without insurance, but even people with insurance can't get in to see their doctors. Yeah. 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 And so it doesn't suggest that we're spending our money very wisely. And, 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 and that'd be one thing yeah. if our healthcare team yeah. was happy yeah they're unhappy right exactly they're increasingly suffering from the diseases of despair that mm -hmm. that we're seeing across the country and but more so because of this issue of they're, mm -hmm. they're, they have this moral injury of trying to do the right thing like you said mm -hmm. but then feeling resistance in every way and being mm -hmm. having to serve so many masters and so i'm i'm so glad that you found a place that and, and ucsf is like that it's mm -hmm. a place that accepts this is what we need to talk about. It may not be the mainstream thinking, but it needs to be, and let's support that. And and I, before I let you go, I have to ask you, because I think this is so important, how are, are we doing women a disservice in how we study, uh, how we run clinical trials and things like that? Well, I mean, unfortunately, women are underrepresented in clinical trials and in, in a lot of clinical trials and certainly in cardiology clinical trials. And so I have worked with a group of other really fabulous women trying to increase in, and increase awareness of the fact that women are underrepresented because women are different than men. Women's risks and benefits are different than men. And you just can't assume that, you know, the same profile in men is what's going to work in women. And, you know, I have colleagues say to me, well, you know, it would be too expensive to do a trial. You know, we have 80% men and 20% women, and we can, so it means that whatever result you find isn't going to be statistically significant. It's not powered in women. Mm. I said, fine, then just do the trial all in women, and you can uh, extrapolate it to men. And they look at me like I'm nuts, you know, but I mean, that's what it's like. That's what we yeah. say to women all yeah. the time. And so, and women, you know, bleed more than men do. They have more procedural complications than men do. I mean, certainly in cardiology, the whole epidemiology is different. You know, women are 10 years older when they get heart disease. So Atypical everything symptoms. about right. Right, is different. And so it's really important to include, you know, women are basically 52% of the population and uh -oh. they... You know, it should generally at least uh, be represented in whatever proportion they get the disease. Right. And the same for, you know, racial and ethnic minorities. I don't think we should exclude older people from trials. I mean, we don't, we don't exclude older people from our practice and from our treatments. Why do we exclude them from the trials? Mm. I mean, then we say to, you know, an 85-year-old, yes, take this drug, when the, the risk and benefit profile is going to be so different than in a young, healthy person that was studied. Right, right. The ninety-year-old on seven antihypertensives, oh, and, yeah. and they're falling. And they're falling over. How? how, <laughs> how as a, I'm a hospitalist, right? How many admissions for LOL in distress mm -hmm. yeah. is medication iatrogenesis, yeah. uh, a syncope passing out from low blood pressure or some other complication of a medication that was not doing them any good anyways that mm -hmm. someone gave to check the box that, oh, okay, I did this, and they're on lisinopril or whatever. Now they have kidney failure and they have this and they have the hyperkalemia and, and, right. and arrhythmias. And you're like, wait, what? And they have somehow got a pacemaker. And you're like, how did that happen? This is right. somebody who none of this needed to happen to. And, and I don't think we even count that in the total of medical errors. Right. When we talk about, oh, it's you know, the third leading cause or it's the fourth or it's the ninth, mm -hmm. who cares? We're not even counting like this huge piece of it. Just like we don't count home care and mm -hmm. lost work in healthcare expenses. Mm -hmm. And that's such a huge, if you really count all those things exactly. and you count social, the social security funds going to paying for medical bills, exactly. you're talking about 50% of our GDP is going to healthcare yeah. and we get number what 29th or something in the developing world in outcomes yeah so 
let's get woke about this stuff. It's, right. You know, we have to be screaming about this. So I'm really glad you came on the show, Rita Redbird, with the amazing, <laughs> you know, 1930s actress name. It's so <laughs> awesome. And it, 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 um, it, it means a lot, I think, that the audience heard your message because I've been talking about it, but I don't have oh. the credibility you have of having done this for a lot of your career, being mm. the editor-in-chief of JAMA, being a professor at, at UCSF, being a cardiologist, and still understanding that the data and and the the way we practice medicine has to be in service of our patients, and sometimes that means less is more. So thank you. My pleasure. It was great to talk to you. And I hope you'll come back when I'm outraged about another thing you've written. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 